Hello, it's podcast number 34. I'm still trying to make up for lost time. Let's see if I can manage that. Uh, I always try to throw in an opening monologue. Hi, I'm Sage Man. That'll be all. Uh, okay, if this is your first time with us, the newest segment of the podcast is devoted to reviewing the old stories on my fanfiction.net account, starting with the three-way crossover saga. A six-book crossover of Monsters vs. Aliens, Maximum Ride, and Twilight, which I wrote ten years ago. Needless to say, I'm not exactly proud of it. Uh, today we're looking at the first half of the third book, Love and War. Let's get this over with. Chapter 1, Reception, narrated by Alice. Uh, when we left off, Hollywood the giant robot dragon was approaching the wedding of Susan and Dr. Cockroach. A few of the wedding guests are aware of its approach, such as Alice, who warns Edward not to let anybody know and spread a panic. You know, the wedding photos will be finished before it gets here. Uh, Derek from Monsters vs. Aliens approaches Alice and starts hitting on her, and we find out that Derek has a special scent that Jasper finds irresistible, like Bella for Edward. He is Jasper's singer, though that's not set out right, because apparently on my first read-through of the Twilight Saga, I completely missed the fact that that phenomenon is called that. So... Jasper dives into the ocean to get as far away from Derek as possible, and Hollywood shows up on the boat, and he and Susan get into an actually pretty well choreographed, if brief, fight. Uh, Susan wins and moves on to cutting the cake as if nothing happened. Okay, good solid start. I'm already liking this one better than the second one. Chapter 2, Voices, narrated by Max. Oh, good chapter title, because not only does it involve Gazzy's ability to imitate voices, getting played for drama for a change, it also involves the voice in Max's head. Good stuff. And, uh, you know, with the voice's comments, Maxis loses her temper, and she tells Susan, I just want to go home. I don't know or care where it is, I just want to go home. Susan ponders how she used to see Modesto as her home, but now sees the whole planet Earth as a home that needs to be defended, and, uh... Oh, man, there's a great moment where they talk about having the weight of the world on their shoulders, which is okay, because Susan has really big shoulders, and Max has four of them. <laughs> That's one of my favorite jokes from this whole thing. I I'd nearly forgotten it was from this. Max says she wants to hang up her hat and coat and just be a normal girl for a little while, and Susan says Max is too special for that. Max is admittedly reassured that someone who's not part of the big massive conspiracy behind her life is telling her that. That was a really, really good chapter. Chapter 3, Last Straw, narrated by Marcus of the Volturi. Uh, this is one that was very well received by the one guy who used to read the story. He'd uh, never seen a Marcus point of view and really liked what I did with it. Uh, the premise of the chapter, someone caught Susan's underwater battle with Hollywood on video, and it includes footage of Jasper helping deliver the killing blow. And so, Caius believes, there's no wriggling out of this. The Volturi will take the Cullens down. It's uh, very short, because there's only so much comedy mileage one can get out of Marcus's perspective, but I definitely got every possible joke out of it that I could. I presented Marcus's apathetic persona as something he very carefully cultivates as part of his public image. Of course, soon I found out why Marcus is like that. It's not in the books or anything, just some background Stephanie Meyer revealed, and found it so heartbreaking that I implemented it into a later appearance by Marcus. More on that when it happens. Chapter 4, The Whole Shebang, narrated by Jacob. That's three Twilight character POVs in four chapters. That's a bit lopsided. Okay, this chapter opens with a joke that made me laugh out loud, in which... Jacob suggests that since twi vampires don't sleep, they spend all night playing pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty funny. So anyway, obviously, uh, Edward and Alice have discovered that the Volturi are coming, and why. Uh, Rosalie is mainly concerned about what this will do about the upcoming production of Romeo and Juliet, which I didn't remember until this moment. Was it established ahead of time? I clearly missed it. If so, maybe this is the first mention of it. I don't know. Anyway, Jacob reminds Rosalie that the play isn't called Romeo and His Mom, so... Rosalie is playing Lady Montague, that's a thankless role if there ever was one, and oh god, I actually created a complete cast list of every Twilight MVA and Maximum Ride character who was acting in this production, didn't I? Did I put that in the actual story? Guess we'll find out. Anyway, sorry. Tangent. So the Volturi are going to spend a month teaching their entire guard to fight hand-to-hand, -hand, since mental powers won't work against the Cullens when Bella is around. There will be no listening to witness testimonies or hesitating for even a second. They're just going to come in for the kill. In a month. In my defense, that also happened in the final Twilight book. So just like in that book, they're going to gather as many people as possible to fight on their side, including their new friends, the Flock, and the Monsters. Renesme interjects that the flock can't fight vampires, so, okay, I guess I did remember at this point how OP Twilight vampires are, 
and it sinks in for everyone that this time they're basically at war with the Volturi, and there's nothing they can do about it. Chapter 5, Amends, narrated by Nudge. Uh, we return to the Flock's Garage Band, where Nudge plays bass, Max plays drums, and Angel is miscellaneous percussion. Max is glad that Iggy's found a hobby that makes him feel better. Indeed, Max wants to continue rocking well into the night, but it's bedtime. Nudge and Iggy share a tender moment together. Iggy seems to have made peace with Nudge's relationship with Aaron, and she's glad she has no obligations until Iggy reminds them that they're going to school. Something often threatened, but seldom really committed to in the Maximum Ride series, though more often in fanfiction, as you might imagine. Chapter 6, Mozzarella Sticks, narrated by the big guy. Okay, chapter title made me laugh. That was very unexpected. Are the bad guys going to try to replace the queso dip running gag with a mozzarella sticks running gag? I think they are. So in this chapter, Mr. Tran presents the big guy with four unique robot henchmen for an upcoming attack on the Cullens. These four characters plus Hollywood form a group I would later call the siblings when I implemented them into a completely different fanfic, and uh... Well, I've often assumed that they'll appear in some sweet kind of vampire, but I'm not entirely sure now that that'll work. Mm. The four siblings consist of Stephanie, a robotic micro-raptor, one of my favorite dinosaurs, a feathery thing with four wings, that's awesome. Van, who is a van with lots of weapons. Lang, who is a one-foot-tall featureless human, I'd later upgrade him into being made of glass for extra awesome. And finally, Alexis, a robot based on the Dungeons & Dragons hook horror with nine senses, that's the five main ones, plus electricity, motion, heat, and thought, all of which are better than any living thing could hope to be, hooks with molecular sharpness, and she's also really good in the kitchen, she makes mozzarella sticks. <laughs> Chapter 7, play reading, narrated by Dr. Cockroach. She's directing our production of Romeo and Juliet with Maximum Ride in the role of Juliet. He points out to her that the wherefore in Wherefore Art Thou Romeo means why, not where, which is something that I point out as often as I possibly can because it's interesting to me and... Uh, Quill and Embry are playing the Capulet guys from the opening scene, and Bob delivers a flawless reading of the lines he's been given, much to Doc's bewilderment. Uh, Edward and Bella, playing Juliet's parents, aren't sure about rehearsing for a play while the Volturi are coming, and Doc says, hey, we'll prepare for the war if you prepare for the play. The rehearsal period is less than a month. Why did I think a production of R&J could be mounted in a month? I'd been in plenty of plays at this point. A play takes, like, two months. I don't know. Chapter 8, Emmett Loses a Leg, narrated by Edward. This is a scene I'm definitely going to recreate in some sweet kind of vampire. The title event, that is. Uh, what else happens in this chapter? Okay, it opens with some fairly decent slice-of-life character moments for all the Cullens. So that's cool. The siblings attack. Uh, Edward reads the thoughts of Mr. Tran and the big guy as the fight goes on. Alexis severs Emmett's leg. Stephanie and Lang are destroyed in the battle, so Alexis and Van retreat, and the two men and two bots are beamed back up to wherever it is they stay, with Jasper held captive, as well as Emmett's leg. Alice is confident that Jasper will escape in time to fight the Volturi, and Emmett is put out by the loss of his leg. He's a vampire. They can reattach it, if they find it. Chapter 9, Class, narrated by Fang. The flock go to school. I assume the school that was dedicated to them at the end of the fourth book. They've gone through quite a few schools, canonically. I, I don't remember. Uh, mm, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, Fang says he wants to date Max. And Max tells him she loves him so much, but not in that way. Deal with it. And now uh, that's it. Not much of a chapter. Uh, perhaps it's significant that they had this conversation in full view of a whole bunch of classmates? Uh, maybe. Chapter 10, Steam, narrated by Nudge. Nudge again? Well, okay. Uh, Nudge is on a date with Aaron in the park. I think this is the first time Eric has actually appeared on page, and uh, they're having fun, wrestling pelicans for some reason, and Aaron goes, hey, what are those numbers on the back of your neck, in a joking reference to the expiration dates that mutant hybrids have in the Maximum Ride series, which I think were completely forgotten about at some point in the book series. Anyway, Nudge uh, obviously doesn't find that joke funny, and she punches him, and runs all the way home crying and takes some comforting advice from Iggy. Chapter 11, Plans for the Future, narrated by Susan. Uh, Susan is doing yoga to get in shape for the big vampire fight coming up. She and Doctor have decided to postpone their honeymoon until after the big vampire fight. Yeah, it's, uh, there's the mandatory joke where Bob mistakes yoga for yogurt and then Yoda. Obligatory, really. And Link asks, how much do you think Bob would fetch us on eBay? Which isn't very funny, but made me laugh for some reason. Uh, Link asks Doc about uh, 
his and Susan's plans for the future of their relationship, and it's clear he's living vicariously through them and wants to see them have a proper domestic life. Susan and Doc figure after the battle, sure, they'll take Link's advice and adopt a child in, uh, in their teens, of the sort that's usually hard to get adopted. Okay, that was good. I enjoyed that very much. This is way better than the second book. I'm, I'm genuinely excited to read the second half of this in the next episode. <clears throat> Today in Drune, we're reading special edition number four, Sorcerer. Let's see that cover. Nice. This book is one of two to be narrated in the first person, this time, as you might expect, by Lord Spar. In my hypothetical adaptation, this episode serves as the season four finale. Ooh, and I almost forgot, special editions have unique taglines. This one says, A powerful sorcerer, a mysterious island. The future of Droon lies in Spar's hands. Hmm, okay, let's do this. <clears throat> Chapter 1, To the Ends of the Earth. We pick up right where we left off, uh, with the newly restored Lord Spar and Kem riding away on the Golden Wasp, pursued by the forces of Ko and Gethwing. Kem gets on-page dialogue for the first time, and turns out to be quite the snarky fellow, heckling all of Spar's heat-of-battle decisions. Spar eventually crashes the wasp into the sea, loses the coiled viper to the icy water, and washes up on a beach somewhere much later. Chapter 2, A Man and His Dog Spar and Kem find themselves on a lush island paradise in the harmless eye of a horrible storm. The island seems deserted for a few hours. Till they find a set of small footprints and smell soup. There, in a tiny hut, they meet Befo, king of the island trolls. And evidently the only island troll. He's making soup with the help of five Bangledorn monkeys, which is odd, as Bangledorn is halfway across Droon. Exactly halfway, according to Befo. With nothing better to do, Spar takes up Befo on his offer to sit and share in a meal, and the flames remind Spar of his past, bringing us into the flashbacks that take up most of the book. Chapter 3, The Forbidden Room. We flash back to about four centuries earlier, to a ten-year-old Spar and a puppy Cam, trying to skip out on their daily magic lessons with Gethwing. While escaping using a fog cloud spell of his own invention, Spar accidentally stumbles upon the room where his mother, Queen Zara, died. According to Ko, poisoned by someone called the Destroyer. Ko summons all his forces to his arena, where Spar learns that the Destroyer is leading a fleet of ships from the port of Nerona and breaching the border of Gaul. Spar volunteers to face the Destroyer, so Ko gives him a special helmet with many powers and sends him off. Chapter 4 Pretty in Pink Gethwing and Spar lead the army to a Nin village. According to Gethwing, Nins are strange, but mostly loyal to Ko. At the city of Nerona, the Droon city closest to Gaul's borders, the Drumar fleet have prepared an attack. Spar and Kem are sent to lead a Nin squadron to sabotage the Destroyer's personal vessel. Spar duels the Destroyer himself, a terrifying giant in black armor, but loses his helmet in the process. Turns out the helmet was enchanted to show Spar what Ko wanted him to see. As it turns out the Destroyer is a 20-something Galen, the Destroyer's ship is the pretty pink ship of Princess Relna. I was surprised to learn that Relna is upwards of 400 years old, I guess it's a wizard thing, not a Sons of Zara thing. And Nerona is a beautiful city, not the ugly, twisted wreck Spar believed. Unfortunately, Spar's sabotage has already happened, and the ship blows up, sending Spar and Galen to be swallowed by a Nin submarine. Chapter 5, By Candle Glow Galen is tied up by the Nins and manages to explain to Spar who he is, showing him the truth. So they decide to team up and stop Ko from his current objective, finding the Iron Gate and awakening the Seven Giants. Chapter 6, The Big Black Iron Gate the Iron Gate, as it turns out, is more of a wall than a gate, but Spar realizes it must have a door only Ko can see, so he puts his helmet back on for a moment, and sure enough, he sees an archway that can walk right through. There, Ko is reciting the incantation to raise Zor and his six identical brothers. I never expected to see Zor again, I do love surprises. Galen fights off the giants with his rainbow staff, while Spar is held paralyzed by a combination of Ko's magic and guilt over betraying him. As Galen attacks Ko, the Emperor tells Spar that he alone knows where Zara is buried and can take the boy there if he saves him. So Spar turns on Galen and prepares to bring the wounded Ko to Silversnow on the back of a massive furry worm called the Grompus. Chapter 7, Under the Mountain The Grompus travels north, pursued by Galen and some of his followers. At Silversnow, Ko reveals the dragon ship will take them to Zara's resting place. The Knights of Silversnow try to block their path, but Spar defeats them, and he escorts Ko within. 
The ship is guarded by six blue tiger beasts who spring to life at Ko's command and hold Galen back as the flying dragon ship sets sail. Chapter 8, The Air Battle. The dragon ship flies to the very peak of Silver Snow, to the dark stair, Zara's glass coffin at its foot. Ko loads the coffin onto the dragon ship to fly to the Isle of Mists to drain Zara's body of her power and strengthen himself. Spar is enraged at Ko's deception and uses the last of his strength to come between Ko and Galen and zap Galen, throwing him from the ship so Ko won't attack him. Chapter 9, Monster. Spar awakens on the deck of the ship, having transformed into a scaly beast thanks to Ko's sorcery. Spar realizes this spell was what killed Zara, was intended to kill Galen, but he, for whatever reason, lived through it, merely becoming a beast. Zara's spirit speaks to Spar, telling him to take the secret stone from her hands and to find her somewhere, someday. Spar bravely hi hijacks Ko's ship, changing course, landing on the ground and taking Zara's body away. Ko flies away in the ship and swears that he will return, that Spar will bring him back personally. Spar is sure he will do so, but in his own time. Spar collapses and sleeps for several days. When he awakens, he finds he is at the Bangledorn Forest, where no beasts may enter, and decides to entomb his mother there. Chapter 10, At Bangledorn's Edge Gethwing approaches Spar, stating that in Ko's absence, he would like to be Emperor. Spar refuses to hand over his secret stone, and he and Gethwing battle. Gethwing takes the stone and flees, but as Spar watches, he and his wing snake army vanish. With Ko at rest, all of the beasts vanish. All but Spar. In the depths of the forest, Spar meets a young Demeter, who suggests that he wash off. The water turns Spar back into a boy, all human but for the fins growing behind his ears, a reminder that he will always have some beast in him. They bring Zara deeper into the forest and are met by a troop of Drumar. They agree to entomb his mother, but tell him that with his curse he cannot live there. But they assure him that since Zara was the Queen of Light, Spar cannot be the Son of Darkness, as Ko named him. Spar instead goes to live in the Darklands. The land's currently completely empty, and dubs himself Lord Spar. Back in the present, Kem finishes the story, how the dark power of Ko slowly turned Spar more and more evil over the course of the next 400 years. And there the story ends. Chapter 11, The Tree of Life. With that, Befo reveals that he was Galen all along, and the five Bangledorn monkeys were the children and Max. Overcome with emotion, Spar embraces his brother. Ko and Gethwing's armies have landed on the tiny island, along with the armies of King Zello and Queen Relna, and Spar leads the heroes to the island's summit. Following the directions of his mother's secret stone, Spar finds the summit, and roots erupt from the ground, the roots of the tree where Queen Zara is entombed, having grown all the way through the planet to reach Spar now, at this moment. Chapter 12, All Bad Things As the armies clash on the island below, Spar has one last flashback. He is five years old, going to visit his mother on her deathbed. She promises to give him the third secret stone someday, somehow, and with the last of her strength she creates chem for him so that he shall never be alone, and breathes her last. In the present, Spar's fins vanish as he hears his mother calling for him. He does his best to apologize to the heroes for four hundred years of evil, and plunges himself into the pit leading to the Bangledorn Forest. Review. Well... This is obviously really great. Probably the single most emotional volume in the entire series. Great world building and backstory that just does a great job bringing everything together from all corners of the series thus far. Can't praise it enough. Fantasy casting. Uh, let's start with Kem in his first speaking appearance and only one until he briefly talks again in the grand finale. I don't really see how the author could have done this, depicting a character with two heads as a single individual. It worked before because, well, he was a dog, but when he speaks, it's a bit surreal. Uh, in my adaptation, I wouldn't want to modify Tony's story so much as to turn Kem from one character to two, but we do have to figure out how to make a character with two heads but one mind talk. I figure we'll have one head do all the talking, arbitrarily, let's say the left one, while the other always has the talking head's exact facial expression to firmly establish that they're one character. As for his voice, I would go with Keith David, basically sounding like Goliath while in his elderly present form and speaking in David's natural voice in puppyhood flashbacks. 
Then there's Befo. I wouldn't use Galen's actor. I would, I would want it to be a surprise that he's Galen. I initially went with Warwick Davis on the logic that in a live-action series all the troll characters should be played by actors with dwarfism. It's animated now, but let's keep Warwick Davis in the role. Why not? He's an actor. He can voice act. And finally, the Drumar, who speaks to Spar in the Bangledorn Forest. For this very powerful moment, I wanted a very powerful actor to play that character. So I'd want to cast Cory Burton as a character I call the Drumar Lord. Burton doing his Christopher Lee impression. Yeah, Christopher Lee was still alive when I decided that, but I went with Burton anyway, because Burton's impression of Lee, which he's done in several roles, isn't perfect. He's a lot gentler and warmer than the real Lee, and that's what the moment needed. No oh, man, this this book might be the best of the series. You know, it's a very emotional journey to get through and unpack. Mm-hmm. Uh, today we're having an extra long Keys and Kingdom segment. It is 1985. We're watching Return to Oz and the Black Cauldron, two incredibly dark and violent cult classics that nearly ruined Disney forever. Yeah, don't worry, they got out of it okay. They're okay now, more or less. Actually, they're doing very, very well, as you, as you may have heard. <laughs> so let's start with Return to Oz. Uh, not for the last time. Disney makes a film allegedly based on L. Frank Baum's Land of Oz novels from the early 1900s, with enough changes so as not to get sued by MGM, creators of the 1930s Wizard of Oz movie. That's a classic movie. I may have to put it in my collection, even though it has no connection to Disney whatsoever. Except that Adriana Casalotti's in it. Disney kind of owned her. But that's a story for another time. Well, a story I would have told in the Snow White episode if I'd figured out the format of my show at that point. Uh, Adriana Casalotti was the voice of Snow White in her contract for Vader from ever acting in anything else again, but she did manage a voiceover cameo in The Wizard of Oz. Okay, story's over. Let's talk about Return to Oz. Well, uh, what I know is it's dark as shit. But to be fair, I believe at least some, if not all, of those details are taken directly from Baum's books weren't quite as cutesy as the MGM film, so Disney did an undisnification here. Relied more on puppets, animatronics, and stop motion than the makeup effects of the MGM film went with for its characters. And uh, that's all I know. Never seen this one. Let's watch it. Well, this movie begins with something we haven't seen yet, the Walt Disney Pictures logo. Didn't expect that. Uh, good to know. Good stuff. Uh, film opens with Dorothy, played by a very striking Feruja Balk, who was 11 at the time, and therefore makes for a much more convincing Dorothy than Judy Garland did. It's apparently six months after the events of The Wizard of Oz, and Dorothy is suffering from insomnia, and apparently continuing to harp on about her adventures in the Land of Oz. So Auntie Em and Uncle Henry, somewhat infamously, decide to take her to a mental health expert. This being said in whenever it's set, I can already imagine the horrors we'll see. Toto is in this film, but uh, Dorothy's constant animal companion this time around is Belina, a chicken. I like chickens. They're funny. At the sanatorium, uh, Dorothy tells the Tin Man's backstory, which the MGM film neglected. That being that the Tin Man is a cyborg who replaced all of his body parts one by one with tin parts thanks to his cursed axe constantly hacking off his limbs and shit. She also mentions the ruby slippers. Uh, they were silver in the books. MGM made them red to show off Technicolor, the same reason the witch had green skin, so that callback is clearly one directed to MGM, not the books. So obviously, Dorothy telling the complete story of the Land of Oz to her psychiatrist doesn't end well. And it's mentioned this takes place two months shy of the year 1900. That's good, I was wondering when the setting was. Same time the book came out, good to know. So this quack doctor here is going to give her electric shock therapy to fix her brain. Yikes. Now in the books, Oz was empirically a real place, but uh, MGM execs felt 1930s film audiences were too sophisticated to believe in such a thing. So they made it all a dream. I don't know how much Dorothy told her aunt and uncle about Oz in the books, but I'm guessing the just a dream ending is what inspired this film, and how everyone thinks it's a dream. Making assumptions here, that's pretty dangerous, never read an Oz book in my life. Some blonde girl keeps approaching Dorothy in a friendly sort of way, very mysterious. Um, looking at uh, IMDb, it seems this film, like most Oz films before and after it, used the And You Were There device of the MGM film. The doctor and head nurse here at the sanatorium are played by the same actors as the two main villains in Oz. Nice touch. And the electric shock therapy begins. 
almost. Uh, fortunately, there's a storm, so the power goes out before Dorothy can really experience it. But they leave her all tied up. The blonde girl appears and unties her to help her escape. Their escape attempt in the storm leads to leads them to a flooding river, and I'm assuming here washes Dorothy straight to Oz, eh? Well, I wasn't wrong. Dorothy awakens next to Belina, who in Oz can talk, which is the thing that was re eventually revealed about Toto in the books. He, he could always talk in Oz, but apparently elected not to in the first few books, and I just realized that's exactly what happened to Total of the Maximum Ride series, who I already assumed was a Toto reference. Uh, getting ahead of myself. There are some... Uh, there are some recognizable puppeteers in the cast, such as Mock Wilson and Pons Mar. If you're into puppetry, those names are recognizable. So, um... Belina is now an extremely convincing animatronic puppet chicken, voiced in a manner pretty much how a chicken would sound if it could talk. Dorothy takes a little longer than she should to realize that it's odd that Belina can talk, which Belina agrees is quite odd. Dorothy says, if we were in Oz, your talking wouldn't be strange at all. A little slow, isn't she? You got her cause and effect mixed up a little there, methinks. Dorothy eventually realizes she's in the deadly desert that surrounds Oz. That's the place's actual name. They have to walk on stones because if they touch the desert sands, they'll become sand themselves. Nice, that goes in the Keys and Kingdoms folder, a place where the floor is lava. Does that rock have an eyelid on it? Is it gonna open? Called it. <laughs> they make their way out of the desert, watched by rocks. Uh, there's a lunch pail tree. A tree that grows pre-prepared lunches. That's cool, is that in the books? Dorothy finds that Munchkin Land is gone, the yellow brick road is in ruins. She follows it and finds the Emerald City is wrecked too, its citizen returned to stone, including the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion, who don't resemble their MGM counterparts at all, presumably much closer to the book version. And here we meet the Wheelers, probably the most iconic feature of the film, men with wheels for hands and feet, who wheel around being sinister. It's uh, Pretty terrifying in a primal fear sort of way. It should be ridiculous and silly, but it's not. Dorothy hides from the wheelers and finds a clockwork mechanical man by the name of TikTok and reactivates him. TikTok is suit performed by a contortionist to give him his very unique shape and stride, uh, puppeteered by the guy who played Admiral Akbar, and voiced by English voice actor Sean Barrett, who I'd never heard of before, so I was surprised to see how prolific he is and continues to be. He explains that the Scarecrow locked him away for safekeeping when everyone somehow began to turn to stone. TikTok beats up the Wheelers, somewhat unconvincingly, and they interrogate one of them to find out what actually happened. The place was conquered by the Gnome King and Princess Mombi. The Wheeler takes them to what remains of the Emerald Castle, where Mombi resides. Mombi is uh, usually played by Jean Marsh, which keeps a lot of spare heads lying around and occasionally switches to a new one, switching actresses in the process. Freaky. Dorothy demands the Scarecrow's whereabouts, and Mombi says the Gnome King took him. Mombi decides to lock Dorothy away until she's old enough to be one of her spare heads. In the Tower Prison, Dorothy meets a Scarecrow-like character called Jack Pumpkinhead, played by Jim Henson's son Brian. I don't much like Brian. Doesn't respect his father's craft much, and I think he's the one who got Steve Whitmire fired, and I adore Steve as a Muppeteer. I don't know, it might have been justified. I don't know what Steve is like as a person, but... Anyway, with Jack's help, uh, Dorothy escapes the tower. She, Jack, TikTok, and Belina steal some of Mombi's powder of life. Oh, fuck. Okay, she gets caught by one of the heads, leading all the heads to start screaming, and Mombi's sleeping headless body to wake up and stagger towards her. It's, it's really fucked up. Anyway, they tie a bunch of stuff together, including a sofa and a taxidermied moose head, and sprinkle the powder of life on it, leading to the birth of the flying sofa moose creature called the Gump. They fly away and successfully escape. How they even thought of that plan, I'll never understand. They have a crash landing on the Gnome King's mountain. Now that's gnome without a G. So the gnomes, they're not uh, they are not what you'd expect from the word gnome. They're stone creatures depicted with stop motion. Uh, they're faces who slide across the surface of whatever stone is available. It's really awesome. The Gnome King comes before Dorothy, being all amiable. They talk civilly for a moment until Dorothy makes it clear that she will take the Scarecrow back, whether the Gnome King wants to release him or not. In return, the Gnome King captures her, countering that all the precious gems in Oz are made in the Gnome Kingdom, therefore he considers all the emeralds in the Emerald City to be his property. Imprisoned, Dorothy reunites with the Scarecrow, played by an English mime by the name of Justin Case. It's not a name, that's a joke name. 
hope it's not his birth name. Anyway, the Gnome King turns the Scarecrow into an ornament and leaves Dorothy all alone in a stone prison. Dorothy breaks down crying, leaving the Gnome King to return and express sympathy. He brings TikTok Jack and the Gump to Dorothy and makes a wager with her. If Dorothy and her friends win, he'll restore the Scarecrow. They at least get three chances to figure out which ornament is the Scarecrow. The Gump goes first, off screen, and the Gnome King reveals the other half of his wager. Those who fail turn into ornaments themselves. Jack goes next. Belina has been hiding in his head for some time, so the gnomes don't know she's there. And when he fails, TikTok proceeds. The Gnome King becomes more and more human as the scene goes on. You know, when the Gump fails, he goes from a face on the wall to a more three-dimensional stony thing, still in claymation, then to his actor covered in stony makeup. He reveals, at this point, that he possesses the ruby slippers, which is what allowed him to conquer the Emerald City. He offers to send Dorothy home so she never has to think about Oz again, but she refuses, staying loyal to her friends, both old and new. TikTok uh, breaks down while he's guessing. It's been, you know, something of a running gag throughout the movie that he breaks down all the time. But, uh, so the Gnome King allows Dorothy to proceed and wind him up. When Dorothy arrives, it turns out TikTok was bluffing about being uh, out of power. He whispers to Dorothy, uh -uh. "Hang on, lost my place in the script. I was, I was, uh, okay." He whispers, "Okay, so TikTok says to Dorothy that if he fails on his third guess, Dorothy will see what he's changed into, and that may give her a clue about where the Scarecrow is." TikTok makes his third guess, but simply vanishes, depriving Dorothy of the clue they hoped for. Meanwhile, Mombi has reached the mountain to warn the Gnome King that Dorothy has a chicken with her. Apparently that's important. Their conversation reveals that Mombi has Princess Ozma captured, and that when no one remains who remembers the Land of Oz, the Gnome King will become completely human. Unfortunately for him, against all odds, Dorothy's third guess correctly locates the Scarecrow. Guessing that all the ornaments the people from Oz have been turned into are emerald green, she finds the rest of her friends, and the Gnome King turns back into his stony self. The Gnome King goes back on his word and attacks them, eating the Gump's sofa body and leaving only his taxidermy head. But when he tries to eat Jack, Belina is revealed, and we learn why the Gnomes have been so afraid of her all this time. Eggs are deadly poison to Gnomes, and Belina, as it turns out, has laid an egg in the Gnome King's throat, slowly and painfully killing him. Well, that's weird. Uh, Dorothy takes her ruby slippers back, and they flee the collapsing Gnome King's mountain. Evidently, he was a load-bearing boss. Dorothy restores the Emerald City to normal and gets them out of there safely by making wishes on her ruby slippers. There's a big celebration in the Emerald City, including the Tin Man and the Lion, who we finally see in action, ever so briefly. Dorothy is asked to become the Queen of Oz, but she declines. Once again, she wants to return to Kansas. Aloud, she wishes she could be in both places at once, and the ruby slippers bring forth the blonde girl from the sanatorium, who turns out to be Princess Ozma. With Oz restored to normal, Ozma returns Dorothy to Kansas. Belina elects to stay in Oz, finding the real world humdrum. Dorothy awakens on the riverbank, where Toto finds her, along with a search party led by Uncle Henry and Auntie Em. Turns out the clinic was burned to the ground in the storm, so Dorothy doesn't have to go back there again. Later, as they finish rebuilding the house, Dorothy speaks to Ozma and Belina through her bedroom mirror, knowing that if she ever wishes to return to Oz again, Ozma will make it so. But for today, she's just going to enjoy a nice day outside. That was certainly a strange and dark film. I, I have to wonder if maybe it was more faithful to the Oz books than the MGM film was. Well, I'm unlikely to ever find out. It's not like I'm going to read the Oz books, but uh, final thoughts... Not especially extraordinary. It feels like a very unfinished film that needed a rewrite, but I can see why it's a dark childhood classic to many people. Hmm. According to the credits, Claymation is a registered trademark. I guess it only applies to the stop-motion work done by uh, one company, whatever that company might be. Uh, that works, because, you know, I'd object to calling something like The Nightmare Before Christmas Claymation. It's clearly more sophisticated than that. Whereas the stop motion in this film is clay as fuck. <laughs> I love it. Also, uh, Deep Roy played the Tin Man. He, he must have been on stilts or something. They definitely chose some odd methods to bring this film's characters to life. 
And uh, now, The Black Cauldron, based on the first two books of The Chronicles of Prydain, a series of fantasy novels, which I certainly would never have heard of if it wasn't for this movie. Might look into that at some point. I do like this film. The books are probably better. Uh, the first Disney animated feature to be rated PG back in the 80s, when PG meant PG, and they had to cut out some violence and partial nudity to get it rated that, so... Trying to go in another direction, I dig it. Um, I believe the first animated film to employ CGI, and a miserable box office flop, but Disney's made a lot of animated films with that status that are looked back upon fondly today. I think Jeffrey Katzenberg was responsible for this film. That guy's a dick, and really bad at what he does. I, I mean, I guess he was at least partially responsible for the Renaissance age of animation as a whole, but I've never heard of a single thing that was his idea that was a good idea. The film begins with the fully animated Disney logo. It uh, must have uh, debuted here. You know, even We saw it in Return to Oz, which came out earlier, but you know. And it's in super duper widescreen. Nice. Uh, backstory. A king so cruel and evil that he was turned into the eponymous Iron Chamber Pot. The cauldron has the power to resurrect an undead army with which to rule the world, and uh, that's it. Short backstory. In a cottage in the woods, we come upon Dalbin the wizard and his apprentice Terran. Nice classic way to start a mid to late 20th century fantasy story. It's interesting that Disney chose to adapt a book of that sort rather than their usual fairy tale. Fair. <laughs> like most apprentices, Terran's main duties are intending to the geese and the pig and whatnot. Uh, Terran whines a lot about how he's special and wants more out of life. As has been said by many a critic before me, he's basically a Disney princess. And he predates most of them. <laughs> Dalbin's pig, Henwen, has the ability to see the future when she is doused in water, which Taryn apparently didn't know despite this not being the first time he's bathed her. Perhaps there just wasn't anything to see before. Dalbin prepares a ritual to allow himself to see Henwen's vision as well, and we see the Horned King searching for the Black Cauldron. Uh, let's see. IMDb credits. Uh, Richard Rich Coderex. <coughs> Hack. Uh, no notable voice actors save John Hurt as the Horned King, uh, John Huston as our very brief prologue narrator, uh, a few notable voice actors as background henchmen. So Taryn and Henwin are sent out on a mission to... Uh, I don't know, I was IMDBing the movie and I missed what their objective actually is. I'm guessing keeping Henwin out of the way so the Horned King doesn't use her to find the cauldron? Sure, let's go with that. Then we meet the Horned King, clearly the only part of this movie Disney isn't ashamed of, as well they shouldn't be, because he's a badass, devil-horned lich, voiced by John Hurt. He has no depth or motivation beyond uh, resurrecting an undead army and ruling the world, but he's extremely badass, and that's good enough. Let's see, uh, Terran loses himself in his daydreams and loses Henwin almost instantly, our hero, ladies and gentlemen, and here we meet Gurgi, everybody's least favorite character. I don't get it. He's, he's basically Gollum, and people like watching Gollum. As uh, Gurgi exists in a Disney film, we need to figure out exactly what he is in Keys and Kingdoms terms. I'm going to look him up. Let's see. The Disney wiki describes him as a gopher wood troll creature. Place to start, I guess. Maybe he's like a forest kith goblin? Hmm. Apparently a restaurant at the Magic Kingdom was named after Gurgi for a good eight years after the film's release. Interesting. Nothing on the Disney wiki about his book origins, so uh, migrating to the Prydain wiki. Knew there would be one. Everything has a wiki. They're not all any sort of quality, but everything's got one. Which describes him as a creature of unknown kind. Not quite animal and not quite human. Unique creatures of unknown origin are certainly worth mentioning somewhere, but I'm going with Forest Gith Goblin. So there's a cheap joke where Terran asks if Gurgi's seen Henwin, and Gurgi describes Henwin in detail, then claims no, he's not seen her. I call it a cheap joke because there's nothing physical to distinguish Henwin from any other pig, so Gurgi does have plausible deniability there when he claims he's not seen one. I'm just saying. But Terran hears Henwin in trouble. She is pursued by dragon-like beasts, which I think have a unique species name from the book, but they're basically just wyverns. We'll call them wyverns. The two wyverns uh, capture Henwin and take her to the Horned King's castle. First time noticing of the CGI used in the film, it's primarily used for backgrounds. The backgrounds look nice, but they clash too much with the animation, which is clearly still drawn on cells. It doesn't mesh. Terran musters up the courage to go to the castle to rescue the pig, but Gurgi declines to join him. The Horned King's henchmen are, uh, well, a bunch of dolts. Yeah, that really diminishes the king's mystique. Rather pathetic. And his right hand is a little goblin called Creeper, who is pure comic relief. 
Yeah, not a great crowd to surround this particular villain. I'm reminded of Mulan. It, too, featured a no-nonsense villain that clashed with the film's tone, and his henchmen were equally no-nonsense, the kind of people a villain like that would actually surround himself with. So, Creeper brings Henwin before the king, and she refuses to show him a vision. Terran rushes in to rescue her and gets got, and the king asks Terran to get Henwin to show him the location of the Black Cauldron. Terran declines, so the king threatens to kill Henwin, which breaks Terran. Terran performs the ritual, but it proves nothing but confirming that the cauldron exists. Terran and Henwin make a break for it, but only Henwin escapes via the moat, while Terran gets captured and put in the dungeon. Terran is soon rescued by and Joan's forces with some fellow prisoners, Princess Ilanwi and an elderly bard called Fluter, both of whom possess magical artifacts that the Horned King hoped to use to find the cauldron. Ilanwi has a little floating ball of light, simply referred to as her bauble, while Fluter has a magic harp with some vague personality of its own, doing things like breaking a string every time Fluter speaks an untruth. Along the way, Terran finds the magic sword owned by the king who first built the castle. What the sword does... It glows different colors, and it can sunder other weapons. And, uh, no need to add that to K&K knows. There are plenty of magic swords in D&D that can do all sorts of stuff. Withaints. Those are the names of the Wyvern things. Uh, very Welsh, this story's character names. Except that they actually sound how they look. <laughs> the Horned King is okay with Terran escaping, as he hopes this means he'll find Henwin. The Gwithaints are sent out to spy on him until he does so. Now, it's said this is the first Disney animated film with absolutely no singing. That's not entirely true. We do catch the last two bars of a song Fluter performs for the amusement of the others after their escape. But if that counts, there's probably never been a Disney film with no singing. After their escape, they cross paths with Gurgi once again. And uh, to Terrence's chagrin, <laughs> he has no desire to associate with a thief and a coward, but Ilanwi takes a shine to him and he helps them follow Henwin's tracks. By following the tracks, they're sucked into the realm of the fair folk. Let's see what these folk tell us about KNK Pixies. Well, the only fair folk with speaking parts are children or elderly, which contradicts what we know about Pixies already. They don't have children or elders. Also, they all have antennae. That's weird. Well, you enter their realm via a whirlpool, which normally is supposed to keep people out, but is in disrepair right now. I guess that's interesting. I, I do like the fashion sense displayed by these fair folk. Fairly dwarvish. Uh, mayhaps these fair folk are sprites rather than pixies. You know, there there is a difference, after all. Hmm. And uh, Henwin is there among the fair folk, and the fair folk know the black cauldron to be in Morba. Terran suggests getting the cauldron first and destroying it so the Horned King can never use it. So King Idalig sends his grumpy sidekick Doli to guard the heroes to Morba, while the king himself takes Henwin back home to Dalbin. In which case, what was the point of removing Henwin from Dalbin's home in the first place? <sighs> in Morva, they come upon the home of a trio of witches. Hmm. What's the definition of a witch in K&K? &K? You know, wizard, sorcerer, and warlock are all clearly defined terms in D&D. Which of those categories does a witch belong in? Probably wizard, but maybe it's just a generic term for any arcane magic using woman. Or another term for a hag, perhaps? No, no, a witch should be a normal person who uses magic. Not a hag. Still, hag covens are worth considering. Terran demands the Black Cauldron, and the witches don't want to give it up, but when they see Terran's magic sword, they offer a trade. Terran accepts the deal, and the witch's house vanishes, all of it but the Black Cauldron. Only then do the witches tell them that the cauldron can never be destroyed, only stopped in the process of creating its army by a living being willingly sacrificing their life by jumping into it. The heroes stew in indecision, leading Doli to depart. Ilanwi and Terran share a romantic moment over all they've accomplished so far, a bit unearned. Anyway, the Wyverns, whose real names I've already forgotten, they show up, they take the cauldron, uh, sent out for the pig, and they find the cauldron. Kind of like losing a canut and finding a galleon in it. Uh, all the heroes are captured, all but Gurgi, who once again chickens out and runs for his life. The Horned King unveils his army of the dead and resurrects them with the cauldron. The undead army ravaged the land, though the scenes of their actual rampaging and killing people were removed from the film for being fucking terrifying. I don't begrudge them that. The sequence is terrifying enough as it goes. 
Gurgi works up the courage to break into the castle and free Terra Nylon and Fluter. Terran attempts to sacrifice himself to the cauldron, but Gurgi makes the play himself, plunging himself into the evil thing and reversing its magic. As the cauldron begins to suck everything into the vicinity into itself, Terran grapples with the Horned King and wins with a weak little shove that sends the king into the cauldron. The king, too, is load-bearing. Two load-bearing bosses in the same year, wow. And the castle collapses, leaving behind nothing but the cauldron, the three surviving heroes, and Creeper flying away on the back of a wolverine. The three witches return and ask if the heroes are interested in trading the cauldron back for the sword. Terran asks if he can trade for Gurgi's life instead. Uh, the witches claim they can't do that until Fluter challenges whether they have any powers at all. Remarkably, this works, and instead of kicking his ass for that insult, they resurrect Gurgi and take the cauldron. Let's see, arcane magic users can't normally resurrect people, unless, of course, they cast the wish spell. That would work. These witches seem that powerful. So, Gurgi sacrifices undone, Terran and Dylon we kiss, and the four heroes walk into the sunset hand in hand. The tapestry over the end credits uh, shows them arriving back at Dalbin's house. A familiar name in the credits, as an animator, henchman voice, and character designer, uh, Phil Nibelink, the creator of Romeo and Juliet Sealed with a Kiss, an independent film that Nibelink made entirely by himself. Animated films generally take about four years to make with a complete crew, so you can imagine one made by just one guy. It's certainly a labor of love and a piece of animation history, even if the film ultimately wasn't very good. Let's see more credits. Uh, Tony Anselmo as an assistant editor. I mean, assistant animator, I mean. Uh, I read the credits. I, I always read all the credits, just something I decided I'd do uh, during the early films when watching the credits, which you'll recall were at the beginning back then. I saw interesting stuff, so I decided to uh, watch every second of every film, end credits and all. So The Black Cauldron, you know, this film's biggest claim to fame is that it lost the box office to the Care Bears movie. Uh, I've seen the Care Bears movie. It, it's not better than this movie. This movie has its flaws, but its atmosphere and characters and setting are all uh, quite good. If only they'd had a chance to be explored more. A very different thing for Disney, but I'm a fan. And okay, I want to proceed quickly, so I've already bought my next batch of movies, and let's do the thing where I talk about what I've learned about Keys and Kingdoms canon based on the last few movies I've watched, including those two I did before the whole depression thing. Dragon Slayer. Lots of ideas. I'm thinking real hard about how to depict the material, somatic, and verbal components of magic. Uh, in scripts for the choices, I've been using Latin incantations, but I'm rethinking that. I've already gotten pretty tired of it. I'd better brainstorm with the crew about how to replace that. Virgin sacrifices and sacrifices by lottery are good story beats, as is a contingency plan involving one's own death and resurrection. Solar eclipses and meteor showers and their effects on magic, like in The Last Airbender and magical horses. The Fox and the Hound. Uh, shotguns and snares, those are cool. And every kind of animal can be tamed, can be trained, can have loyalties, can understand commands. I've established that very well by now, but I have to think about the implications it has on the setting. Like Pokemon. Tron. Lots to take away there. The cyberspace notion, programs and their users, that might end up being a factor in some K&K &K campaign setting. Also arcades as a feature in more modern settings. The, the Tron imagery such as motorcycles, space armor, recognizer airships, solar sailors, disc weapons. I like the premise of the MCP, that it grows more powerful and intelligent by absorbing the powers and skills of others. Though in reality he just sits there. The Gladiator games, including the Light Cycle Battle and the Concentric Rings thingy, those are cool, and the whole notion that a certain religious minority receives substandard training in the games. The scene with the pool of pure energy is a very understated, well-done scene. I, I like the concept. The Io Tower is sort of a church, and a hypothetical regime that declares gods don't exist while the elites communicate with gods openly is such a good idea that this movie really doesn't deserve it. Something Wicked This Way Comes. Uh, definitely my favorite part of this film was the quirky local characters. Gotta keep that in mind for every setting. Animated tattoos are cool. Carnivals. You know, every D&D game should have a carnival at some point. You know, sinister magic carnivals are obviously a good plot point, but sometimes you should let your characters enjoy a normal carnival. 
Carousel of Age Shifting. Uh, age Shifting is an intriguing plot device. I, I see it is in this D&D edition. It's an option if you're fighting a Sphinx. So something that might happen to you. Good template in this film for devilish characters offering deals. You know, granting desires but then screwing you over with them. The only origin we get for our villains being the Autumn People, the Hungry Ones. I like evocative, mysterious stuff like that. And a Hall of Mirrors is a great place for a set piece. Ba -ba -ba, Mickey's Christmas Carol. Really, you know, we're talking Christmas Carol inspirations in general. Just that kind of Dickens sort of setting. And a Marley-themed undead, like some kind of chain ghost that fights with its chains. Creatures inspired by the three spirits, as they're usually depicted, is uh, worth thinking about. Return to Oz, lots of creativity to be mined there. There's the use of electric shock therapy, you know, medicine in fantasy worlds can't be all that great. After all, at least when it's not magic. High stakes game with the floor is lava. The lunch pail tree is quite an inspired bit of whatever. Traveling to other worlds via storms is a staple of the Oz universe, I dig it. The wreckage of an iconic location is a nice classic bit of shocking imagery. Monsters with wheels are worth thinking about. Strange evolutionary path, that. Villain with spare heads. Stony creatures like the gnomes, they were very inspired. They're kind of like living shadows, only rocks. Villains who love to make deals and wagers. Those will come up a lot in the Disney Renaissance, but the Gnome King proved they predate that in Disney history a teensy bit. Finally, villains who are terrified of chickens is a very interesting concept to me, and I, I'd like it even better if it was for absolutely no reason. Uh, finally, the Black Cauldron. Wizardly apprenticeships as a start to an adventure. Oracular barnyard animals. You know, some special powers of some sort. Undead armies. You know what I've noticed a lot of is, uh, in a lot of movies and stories, undead are completely invincible. In D&D, skeletons are fairly easy to dispatch, but an undead army would have a few advantages over a living one, to be sure. Unique creatures of unknown race and origin. Slash forest kith goblins. Uh, Gurgi could be either one of those. This movie had some good cultural motifs for perhaps sprites. Or maybe pixies. Uh, hag covens and the bargains they might make. Powerful magic for powerful magic. And the Sacrifice Play, a magical artifact that requires such a thing. Whew, this concludes our broadcast day. Thanks for listening to the podcast. The next one will be out uh, sooner than this one. This one took a whole week. I'm, I'm trying really hard not to do that right now for obvious reasons. I will see you soon, listeners.